Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to your Thursday edition of the Trader Merlin Show. And it's a Thursday edition. What am I talking about? It's Tuesday. The reason I thought Thursday is because typically that means I have one show left, and that means tomorrow is going to be th my Friday show. Tomorrow will be uh, Wednesday, and I am not going to do a show Thursday, Friday, or Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday of next week. As you guys know, I'm going to be going back up north, just making sure we all know that. Wow, that's a bright-looking shirt. Damn, it looks good. All right, um, uh, this is the topic for today. <clears throat> Stock market train keeps rolling. I asked AI to make the mountains look like price charts, and that's what I got. I think it looked pretty good out there, so hmm, a, a nice looking chart there. Anyway, um, as we look at these markets, we asked a couple weeks ago, do we think these markets can hit all-time highs? I had a data glitch on my charts, which made me say, no way we'd hit them by the end of the year. When I fixed that data glitch, <clears throat> it's like, yeah, actually we're way closer than I thought we were. For pretty much foregone conclusion for the NASDAQ, the Dow, the Russell might be a little tricky, and the S&P could still get there by the end of the year. So I'm going to start off with that, and we'll run through our top seven, our top eight, and then I'll go into a, an interesting listener question from Peter talking about to buy a car, to lease a car, what should you do? So I'll uh, get to that question on today's show. If you have any questions, send them on in in the chat. <clears throat> I will be watching all of your chat. All right, we'll start at the bottom. One of our catalysts for why we saw this market moving up. We had that nice bounce two days ago for the dollar index, but gave it back today. On the day down 0.38%. You can see nice little uh, series of two red candles here. Again, because it's making this series of lower lows and lower highs, the expectation, at least in my opinion, is that this is going to continue until it doesn't. Now, later on, there are some areas of interest for anybody who's looking for a strong bounce point. It really, to me, just goes all the way back to these lows we saw in July of this year, which are between 99.95 and 99.57 on that dollar index. Now, for those who may be new to the dollar index, what it represents is it's the value of the dollar in relation to a basket of other currencies, including the Japanese yen, British pound, Swiss franc, Swedish krona, and of course, the most important one is the euro. The euro is about, I think it's 50% plus. Actually, the British pound may not be in the one, excuse me, because the British was in the euro when they did the calculation. Either way, uh, we're looking at the euro being over 50% of that index. So that's it's the driving force behind it. That said, we are seeing weakness in the dollar index, meaning most likely strength in the euro, which we can check here. <clears throat> now, for us to get to that lower area of demand, the str at least the strongest one, there are other areas of demand, but this is the, the strongest one on this chart, at least for now, you got to drop about another 2.15% on this dollar index. If that were to happen, we would certainly see, I think, all three of the major indexes, that's the S&P, the NASDAQ, and the uh, S&P, NASDAQ, and the Dow go to all-time highs. Russell, I think, will still lag, but I'll show you that here in just a second. So I think this is your real driving force for the markets. Yeah, you're thinking it's the momentum on holidays and buying. It could be that. But the, the weaker this dollar gets, the more strength it's going to add to our equity markets. And right now, it looks like it's going to keep on rolling. So stay long, stay strong. That's right, Pepe. The krona, the Swedish krona, because it's such an integral part of global economies. I, I jest. Maybe it's all because of IKEA. That's a, I love IKEA stores anyway. But yeah, I don't know why the Swedish krona is in there. But it is. And you know, there's actually two different measurements of the dollar index. There's one that's completely overweighted towards the euro, which is the one that everybody uses called the Dixie. There was one that was put out by, oh, I'm trying to remember who actually put that index out. It's just that you type in US, let me see if I can actually bring it up on this chart. If you type in US dollar, it may actually tell you, uh, FXCM, that's right. FXCM put this one out here. And what it represents is the dollar evenly weighted against um, a basket of four currencies, I believe. So, but, but most people are using the, the Dixie, which is DXY. So <clears throat> they're gonna look pretty similar. Chio, Pueblo Mexico, ah, buon viaggio. Uh, of course, that was Italian. I don't know why you're sitting here in Mexico and I'm speaking Italian to you. But uh, yeah, we have a good vacation down there. Enjoy. Hopefully, it's a little bit warmer. It's uh, cold and rainy and muggy down here in SoCal. I did go to the dog beach today. And for some reason, it's funny, raining where I live. And then I go to the beach and it's actually sunny, warm, clear weather and beautiful. So my dog thoroughly enjoyed his saltwater bath today. TMI for you viewers out at home. So that's a big factor. Number one, at least for me anyway, over the next coming months is going to be, as I mentioned, number one is going to be crude oil to keep an eye on. Dollar index is a close second. Bond would be your number third, third one to keep uh, a good eye on for the next couple of months. All right, so here's your 10-year. You can see we really had for the last three trading sessions, no real action happened with that 10-year, although notice where we're at. We're right down near this area of demand that goes back to July of this year as well, and we are just right about there. So four days of hesitation. Um, you know, The longer it stays here, 
the more likely those yields are going to go down. At least the trend is going to continue on down here because if there was an imbalance between buyers and sellers, typically you would see this thing shoot to the upside, but we're not getting that right now. So hesitation on that 10 year yield. <clears throat> Uh, fifth, sixth place, two, three, uh, sixth place with the NASDAQ today, even though you had yet another green candle. I feel like they just did this red candle back here on Thursday of last week just to break up the monotony of green candles. If you look at it, we've had every day a green candle since December 7th. And, and we had just that one little one on the 14th, but uh, all in all, ridiculously strong moving to the upside. Now, here is the NASDAQ futures as most of you will look at this chart and go, oh, NASDAQ is at all time highs. And yes, but that's not what you should be looking at because the futures, again, price things out in the future. So if we go NDX here, which will bring up the dollar index, this is something that you can't trade, but it tracks the markets. I've had this one mapped out here. You can see that the uh, the high is 16,764. And right now, 16,000. 811, which means officially, ding, 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 cue the fireworks. Where's my crazy sound effects like Jim Cramer and bah, bah, all the weird stuff? We are at an all time high for the NASDAQ 100. So let me check real quick. Let go to Comp X and see if we can get that NASDAQ composite. Usually it's Comp X. I haven't looked at it in a long time. Uh, do, 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 do. Yeah, I'm not sure which one it is. I want to click this Comp Index CAD, but I don't know. Um, I don't know what that, that CAD represents, so I'm going to not do it. <clears throat> we'll look at that one once I get the actual ticker symbol. So uh, moving up from sixth place to fifth place, S&P 500. You, again, you look at that futures market, and you're like, hey, we broke through all-time highs. No, we didn't. <clears throat> it may feel like that, and just an unbelievable rally here. Here's the SPX. Now, that red line at the top is your all-time high, which is 48.18. Right now, you're at 47.58, so what that means for everybody is... 50 point move in the s p and we'll be at all-time highs um, and that could happen here right by the end of the year we were up 0.59 percent on that dollar index today that was 22 point increase so you know 50 points from here uh it's about a, what a 1.1 1.2 percent increase from current levels which could easily happen especially the way these markets have been moving over the past couple of weeks so uh, s p looking great but not quite there most likely we will get there by the end of the year we do have another week and a half so <clears throat> I'm going to keep on moving up the ladder. Gold. Yay. Thank you, gold. Gold had a nice little up move today, although I still don't think we're out of the woods yet. You can see some of the graphics I have here, at least drawn out. Uh, that's not intended to be a strong supply zone that that yellow box is in. It's just, for me, a reference point that if we can get above that, uh, I'd like to go long on a breakout thinking we have more upside movement. Now, today, of course, that dollar, because of its decline, gave a little bit of extra fuel to gold's rally. Gold on the day was up 0.57%. Um, I, as you know, am in silver, SLV. I did not sell my calls against this one today. I thought about it, and I'm like, you know what? I'm going to wait. I think you're going to see silver and gold move up over the next couple days. So I will wait to sell my monthly options on that 1% account, and I'll actually get a lot more than 1% on the underlier, and then I'll get uh, an extra 1% premium on whatever strike price I decide to sell. So there we go. We just need a tweet from the old man back in the day. Uh, who are you talking about, Jim Cramer? Uh, yeah, Jim Cramer, give us some tweets and, and really rock this market. All right, so we're at almost at podium time. Now we're there. Here is the Bitcoin price chart. On the day, Bitcoin looking decent, up 0.61%, but all in all, really not a lot to, to talk about here. I've got this kind of compression channel or pennant formation. A lot of people will talk it, I'll call it. Uh, typically, when that breaks, it's going to break to the upside here. Right now, you're at 42360 on the Bitcoin futures. And again, I don't think that there's anything really that noteworthy to talk about from a technical perspective on that chart. Okay, second place. Oh man, I, I wanna I need to make notes to revisit these shows because sometimes, you know, the sometimes my calls are good, sometimes they're bad. Uh, I think that this is gonna be a good one. I think you're gonna see oil prices start to tick back up here. That downtrend's gonna break here shortly. And as this does start to move up, everything is going to change. That means that the entire Fed position will start to um, backpedal from their current posture of, hey, we're going to hold and maybe even start lowering. Expectations are maybe in March. If oil rallies back up, let's say it recoups 50% of this move, inflation is going to be back on the table. They'll talk about having to raise rates to fight inflation. So to me, going to be very, 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 very interesting uh, at least for me, uh, how this pans out. Now, you may ask, what's a 50% retracement of that one? Let me go here. Hopefully, I didn't tweak these too much, which I did. 50% um, retracement. Hold on. 
is what you get when you teach a class on how to use Fibonacci and they don't, uh, I don't reset my fibs the right way. There we go, put that in the middle. I'll take out those numbers there. Boom, boom, and we'll put our fibs back in. Okay, so these are all the fib lines. A 50% retracement would bring it up to about 80. And here we are at 73.94. So that could easily happen. Uh, a rally back up from current levels to that fib retracement line of 50%, which is technically not even fib, would mean we see crude oil increase but to the tune of about 9.27%. And again, I'm looking at that going, if that happens, then all of a sudden you can hear Jerome Powell and all those FOMC members very quickly backpedal on their stance about potentially lowering. And I think we'll see that whole dot plot shift. Now, uh, I don't know if you guys heard it today, but one of the, I forgot his name, one of the FOMC uh, members was on CNBC today. They did a couple really good questions, but um, you know they keep citing inflation. And of course, we, we've been watching here, you guys can see it, um, that you are looking at inflation numbers that are being very manipulated by energy. And that could very, very, uh, let's, let's downhill the charts, it could very quickly um, change the perspective of the FOMC voting members. So let me go and show you just the uh, the forecast here. I know we've looked at this one quite a bit, but I wanna bring it up anyway because we may see these numbers start to shift. And I should take screenshots and update them for down the road because right now they're anticipating March. Uh, yeah, they're saying 67% chance that we should have a rate cut by March. If we get in um, crude oil rallying up another 9% from current levels, I don't think that's gonna happen. I think you'll see it a bit pushed out even further. Now, I do think we're gonna see rate cuts next year. I mean, it makes sense to cut rates during an election year. It sounds good, lowering rates, it can end. Uh, it's kinda like window dressing for trading firms. They can look back and go, all right, well, you know, we, we did lower rates a bunch in the year and, and therefore the markets are gonna do better because of our actions. And, and they wanna have that on their on their docket, right? Their proof of work, if you will, for the FOMC at the end of the year. So I'm pretty sure we'll get uh, cuts by the end of the year. But I do think that this December 24th plot, that you're gonna see all of these expectations shift higher in the coming months if crude oil continues to rally to the upside because it will skew all that inflationary data. So maybe I will uh, see if I can just take a screenshot of this one right now. Boom, all right, I'm gonna keep a copy of that just for my personal records and say, on this day, I made that call. Not that the call was important. It's really about how I position myself and my portfolio and capitalize on those moves should they happen. But to me, I mentioned, I think it was yesterday's show or the day before, that's your most important piece for our markets uh, over the next couple of months is going to be crude oil, period. Um, the FOMC was, uh, no, it was a different guy. This guy wasn't dodging questions. He, they asked about his specific dot. So you guys know there's a thing called the dot plot, which is what every voting member gives their expectations. They don't attach their name to it, so you don't know who is voting which way. Uh, and usually during their interviews, they don't talk about how they're voting or what their feeling, their actual vote was. They'll give a general idea of their, um, how they're feeling about it, but they don't ever specify specific numbers. And he did that today. I don't think he dodged the question um, much at all. I thought it was actually pretty good. But his comments are, were in line, in line with my thinking, which is, yeah, things are looking rosy right now, but we have this kind of one point data that's really skewing everything until we start to see uh, improvement in other areas. We wanna see GDP steadily increase. We wanna see more employment numbers come into the picture. We wanna see job uh, wealth creation coming in, meaning people are getting higher salaries and things like that. Then, then we'll feel more comfortable with it. But, but for now, uh, they, they're a little bit skittish because the data has happened so quickly. He cited the last three months. It's like, yeah, that's because crude oil has fallen so much in the last three months. Um, Swedish economy and by proxy, the corona is based on hockey. <laughs> this is science. Don't question it. And Swedish fish and pickled herring. Um, you know, it's funny if you go to like a club up in LA, you walk out of the club, the wee hours of the morning and you got Dodger dogs and people selling, you know, um, a hot dog on the sidewalk. In Sweden, you get two different booths. One of the booths they have, um, which I love, which is Swedish meatballs and mashed potatoes. So you get this, like a little plate, like a cup thing of just uh, mashed potatoes and Swedish meatballs. Huh. That's a great hangover helper right there. And then the other one, they have pickled fish stands all around, and I don't get that one at all. I don't know how you Swedish people do it. Pickled fish, you can come out from a club and swallow some gigantic pickled stinky fish. Whoa. Now, Swedes do it differently over there. Good times, my time in Sweden. All right, uh, move away from my travel stories before they get way beyond PG-13. Uh, so that's crude oil. Again, I, you know, I, I, I'll take this Fibonacci retracement line off of here, and let me get that one out. There it is. Uh, I'll leave that right there just so we can kind of see what that number may represent. But it's, um, yeah, that's your, 
a target that I have set here for crude oil. And again, if we get there, that's going to have a pretty good impact on the equity market. So keep your eye there. Now, here is the real uh, insane one. So bummed I did not buy this one, but shoulda, coulda, woulda. Can't dwell on it. Russell 2000 continuing on up again, 1.95%. Now, going off those lows that happened after the greatest day of the year, which is October 26, to where we are right now. Let me uh, zip that out there. To the From the bottom to the peak right now, the Russell's up 24% in 36 trading sessions really unbelievable oh thank you mr mcginnis i was i was debating shaving it off but uh yeah um I, I may be converting to the beard clan here although i have a horrible beard i it's a weird one for me but uh we'll do it so let's look at this from the all-time perspective so if you look at the russell 2000 clearly you have a long way to go before you even get close to the uh all-time highs. Now, this is the futures chart, not the index, but I'll just do it from the futures because it's it's just kind of the same sort of relevance. You're looking at about 2460, and we are at uh, just over 2000 on this one right now. So you've got another 420 points before we even can have the discussion about the Russell hitting all-time highs. I doubt, I really doubt that we're going to have all-time highs, meaning 20% move from the Russell within the next two weeks. So Michael says, so I listened to several fish songs and I didn't see the reason someone would spend thousands. What is the attraction? <laughs> Everybody says that until you go to a show. Look, their music is not, uh, yeah, it's a long conversation. There's, there's a senior thesis that they wrote back in 1983 for college, and the four of them played in their dorm, uh, these four members, they played this collection of songs which make up the story, which is kind of like the never-ending story. Um, but there's a lot of... Uh, Ah, anyway, hey, you don't have to like them. I don't care. It's fun, fun to me. Um, every show is different. It's the collective uniqueness of each show. The members, a lot of bands out there lip sync and have fake music playing in the background that they just ad lib over. These are four of the most talented musicians in the world who've been playing together for over 40 years, so they know each other inside and out. Um, they do things like play washboards and trump on trampolines and play trombones and play vacuum cleaners, which makes no sense to anybody who's never heard of them before. That said, I'll give you one reason, Michael. When you go back, there's a thing that Fish did a while back called the Baker's Dozen. And the Baker's Dozen was 13 nights at Madison Square Garden. It's the longest continuous run of any one particular band at Madison Square Gardens. And for 13 nights they played. They didn't repeat one song over those 13 nights. It was Each night was completely different songs, a completely different show. You tell me any band, any band that, could, that has that big of an arsenal and can play that much music. There isn't one. You could argue the Grateful Dead. You could say the Rolling Stones, but the Rolling Stones cannot play 13 nights in a row of unrepeated songs. It's just not going to happen in this day and age. So it's just uh, musical and interesting. Anyway, this is not a fish show. We're going to move on. I'll send you videos of, of what the fish show in Vegas is like, because I will be going one way or another. All right, Marcus says, yes, uh, new high, but not spot. Yeah, I, that's probably because of the cost of SPY. And this is where these things get um, difficult. You know, when you look at the futures chart market, it's a good point. When you look at um, the futures chart, obviously that's discounting price a little bit. It's rolling over, so you got these contract breaks, and that, that messes things up. You would think that the SPY would be a better representation of it, but it, what this has is has fees built into it. So it's taking out a very, very small percentage. If you really want to see if a market has done something, you look at the actual index of it, and that is the SPX. So the SPX is that cash index, and that's the one that you want to be using. I can go here, right? And it shows, let me make sure it shows the exact same numbers. It should show 4818. Yeah, there's 4818. So there you go. <clears throat> um, yes, Les, I would argue that they musically have more content than the Beatles. And I know I'm going to get hate for that one, but the Beatles... Um, predominantly played their own stuff and they'd have to repeat at each show. Now, even if they did 13 albums in a row, the ability for a band to go out there and play all those songs proficiently with extreme talent without fub, you know, fubbing it up and messing up is, is very, very difficult to do. Uh, <laughs> I have had plenty of um, facial hair uh, configurations over the years, that's for sure. All right, back to the markets. So, uh, th that's the the top of it. That stock market trend keeps rolling. Again, I don't see anything that's going to change that anytime soon. If we look at the markets, the tail end of this week, so we've got Wednesday, Thursday, Friday left. Next week, uh, you've got a short week, right? You've got a Monday markets are closed. And then 
The next week, Monday, it's going to be closed again. So you get a couple weeks of shortened trading weeks. Again, most people leave and go away. I really have not planned on, nor do I plan on, on making any big trades um, by the end of the year. If anything, I might reallocate some capital by selling some puts or calls on positions I may have. Uh, but at this point, you know, I don't see anything that's really selling off and giving me opportunity. When I look at my watch list here for my 1% portfolio, let me go here to all these. You know, I could run through this list, but every one of them is just screaming to the upside. So me trying to sell puts on these positions right now within the, my 1% accounts just don't really make sense. Um, you know, I, I need to be selling things at a discount when people are panicking and paying a lot of premium for puts. This doesn't really uh, have a lot of meat on the bone for me from a put selling perspective. Ooh, XLB is interesting. XLB coming right back into those highs we saw back in July of last year. So that, that that's an interesting one. But yeah, right now, no, no, not going to... Um, not going to make any big attempts here. Again, the main one I'll be doing is, is SLV. Um, I need to sell some calls against this position, but I do think you're going to see it rally. The other one that I have right now uh, is Walmart. So I'm long Walmart. Uh, you know, I was exercised um, on Friday, hit my strike price of 155. I collected like 2%, I think it was about 2% premium. And uh, I'm long right now 155, less the premium I collected. And I'll probably sell calls against it. Those are probably going to go right around that 169 mark, which is right up here uh, before it starts to close that gap. Now, knowing Walmart and the way they're operating, holiday season, et cetera, you know, I, I am feeling bullish on Walmart, but uh, I don't want to get too crazy. So, yeah, right, Big Eb, not much premium. Not much premium at all. It's kind of uh, disappointing, especially for the the accounts of mine that are reliant on premium. Um, you know, one area that I'll slip in, not in my 1% accounts, because I have very strict rules on those, but I have other accounts, which we'll share with you on our year-end wrap-up show next uh, next Friday. Yeah, that's the last day of the year. Um, we'll do a year-end wrap-up show. I've got one account in particular that's just getting killed this year because... I have taken some swings on really volatile stocks. And those are typically ones like uh, First Republic was one that got me pretty bad. And there's been a couple other trades in there that have taken big chunks of capital out. Uh, but typically, I'm not selling option premium on really volatile securities like that or AMC or, or uh, GameStop where there's a lot of premium, but uh, the volatility and risk just isn't there. So in my big, my really big accounts, uh, it's been slim pickings over the last month. month and Actually, the last two months has been slim pickings. So kind of enjoy the... the um, the silver side of things. Margaret says, um, what's the schedule? So uh, I'm doing a show tomorrow. I am I'm teaching a class tomorrow from for OTA from 7 o'clock until 1.30. And then I'm getting in a car and I got to go to NorCal. So no show Thursday, Friday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Uh, I'm going to be traveling up to Northern California and uh, won't be doing the show while I'm up there. So there you go. Let's see. Uh, with all due respect, if anybody had a fish show not in the mind altered state, their dancing is stone. Woodstock, tippy stuff. Yeah, I'm I'm not in an altered state at all. Uh, I might have a beer or two while I'm there, but yeah, I don't do any any drugs of any kind at the end of these shows. A lot of people are. <laughs> a lot of people are, which is really interesting. If you guys know of the Sphere in Las Vegas, you know the Sphere has incredibly uh, steep steps. And also the vertigo that this venue can create. I'm really curious to see what's going to happen. And a lot of these fans are going to be losing it. Uh, let's see. Technically, this Friday should be day one of Santa Claus Rally. Yeah, you know, that's a good point, Liz. I was going to talk about that, but I will wait 35 seconds because I think that your ads are going to start here any second, I believe, in 35 seconds. So uh, I will let those ads run and I'll, sh I'll, brought up, um, I'll bring up that specific piece we'll talk about the santa claus rally i was actually going to do a show on the santa claus rally i might talk about it tomorrow but i don't have a lot of time so um you know the, that santa claus rally typically is the last five days of the year and the first two but we have some very interesting things that have been happening in our markets over the past couple of months uh you know it's a question of does it really happen again this year so here come your ads in three two one all right so i'll continue let's talk about that santa claus rally Santa Claus rally statistically, and, and this period of time is coined by Stock Traders Almanac, that's Yale Hirsch, um, you know, his son right now taking it over. Um, awesome. Keep it going. Um, from the perspective of what they've created, that little index, it's the last five days of December and the last, uh, or the first two days of January. So if we pull up the calendar here, I'll bring up the calendar just on the screen so you guys can see it in the bottom left-hand corner over here. There you go. Um, if you look at this one, you know, the last five days really start 
this Friday the 22nd, because it's the 22nd, the 26th, 27th, 28th, 29th. That's the last five days of December. Markets are closed on January 1st, and then it'll be the second and the third. Now, what I find really interesting about this statistic is, is really interesting. Oh, you had a Dave Ramsey ad? Oh, how do you get Dave Ramsey on this channel? Bring him on the program. So um, if you look at those five days, last five days of the year and the first two of January, on average, going back to 1950, you get a 1.3% move over those seven days seven day window which is crazy because if you look at what's happened in our markets today i mean hell the the s p was up today alone 0.57 the russell was up 1.95 so it doesn't seem like a lot but statistically 80 percent of the time since 1950 the markets have been up 80 percent. that's a pretty alarming statistic now do i think it's going to happen this year do i think that starting from this friday to january 3rd we're going to see up markets i do simply because the statistics my gut tells me it's not going to happen this year simply because look at look at the rally, All right? Let's bring up that S&P 500 here. Or there's a yes. I mean, how much more are you going to go? Uh, let, let's let's just zoom this down a little bit here, and I'm going to um, oops, I'm going to do a little uh, stretch of current price and go. Let's say from right here to where we are right now, where is 1.3 percent? 1.3 percent would put us right about. Uh, let me, let me try. I'm trying to draw it all out here. Sorry, guys. Uh, put us right about 48.85. I mean, that that could absolutely happen. Um, I don't see why. And that's on the S&P futures. Uh, that could certainly happen. It's not that far away. But it, man, it just feels like there's so much buying going on right now into this market in the last you know two months. That what's the 1.3 percent going to really do to things? I don't know. I feel like it's. Uh, I feel like we may peter out here, but statistically, you can't ignore it. 80% of the time, that Santa Claus rally works. Now, here's some statistics that Big Eb probably knows well because he reads it. Uh, no, I didn't get tickets for the Sphere show, Big Eb. I will. I'm, I'm going one way or the other. I, I will be there. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to be there. So, statistics for you. Um, in an average election year, all right, and again, this goes back, I want to say, to the 1950s. You guys type in a chat. What, what is the rate of return of the S&P 500 typically during a presidential election year? That's an interesting question. Type it in chat what you guys think. What's the typical rate of return um, for the S&P 500 during a presidential election year? Now, of course, you know there's going to be some kind of catch here because why would I present it like this? In looking at the stats and the data on it, it's actually rather interesting. Going back to the 1950s, during an election year, the market returns, during an election year, on average, 7%. 7%. Which is crazy because the average market return is 10%. So you're telling me that statistically an election year is less than the historical average. And, and yes, here's why. The year of the election, so this coming election year, 2024, based off historical stats, should be 7%. What's very interesting is the year before the election year, the average is 17. And I think that's very interesting because here we are. Uh, here we are. Let's, let's look and see what we're actually up right now. I know these numbers can be slightly skewed, but um, you know, we're having a tremendous year. Now, if you look at the statistics, which I did not look at the statistics beforehand, and go from where we were, let's bring this line all the way over here. I'll drop it to the opening price. We are roughly, can I get to there to there? Uh, we should be, there it goes, 24.88% move. So we are historically higher than the market average, but not beating the uh or sorry we are and we are beating the historical average for the year before presidential election year so and there's a lot of other very interesting stats around that one but i thought i would share that because i i found it interesting you know they they say the average market return is you know eight to ten percent okay call it ten but you're telling me in an election year it averages seven so it's technically worse performing than the historical average of the s p yet most people will tell you election years are good for the market well yeah because they're averaging seven percent Anyway, random facts that you're going to learn on this program. Got to love it. So um, let's see. I click on ads that irritate me thinking that the advertiser pays and the content creator earns. A pretentious dog food company paid Merlin early. Oh, pay me. Give me. I made like probably a penny off that ad. 
Uh, John, I don't have that statistic. I don't have what the year after the election looks like. Um, Big Ed probably has the Stock Traders Almanac site, and he could probably give us those numbers. He's, he's my resident Stock Traders Almanac expert. Uh, but yeah, I don't have that stat. Really. I, the only reason I looked them up, John, is because I did a presentation for OTA for a holiday party. And you know, given the fact we're in election year, or we're going into an election year, I thought it would be interesting just to bring up those statistics. But I don't have the year after, unfortunately. Um, higher than it was a non-election year. Yeah. Uh, there was also some interesting ones, you know, talking about if if it's a re-election campaign, there's different rates of return versus if it's, you know, a clean slate election. Uh, yep, Stock Trader's Almanac is awesome. Uh, it's a great publication. I love it. All right, let me go to an interesting question here. Now, I, I don't know if I have a definitive answer. I'm going to let you guys walk through this one. And you tell me what you guys think at the end of all this, right, at the end of it. And it brings up some very, very interesting questions that... I think depends on each person's individual approach to it. So here we go. The question is from Peter. He says, it is time to buy my son a car that he will have for the next 10 to 15 years. Peter, he ain't going to have that thing for 10 or 15 years. He's going to get swap it out as soon as he can. Um, which means purchasing a good quality car at a reasonable price. The personal finance question is, should it be purchased for cash, financed for 48 or 60 months, or leased, and then purchased at residual value? And I'm like, okay, well... Of all of that, um, I can start off by telling you my approach. My approach is always, and I don't, I don't, I don't get loans for cars. I don't lease them. I'll pay cash, and I make sure that I have the money, and I pay cash for the car. And that car is now mine, and I own it. No one in the medium intermediary. However, if you look at this one, here's this, and he did great work. Um, this is great work here. So. Hear me out, everybody. It definitely presents a different paradigm for what we, uh, compared to what we historically have done. And those numbers might be kind of hard to see. Unfortunately, I can't zoom in on this. Uh, let me see. I can modify this graphic just a little bit and zoom in. Hold on one second as I go into this picture here. And I'll try to make it bigger for you guys. Yeah, that might, that might look a little bit better for you. Okay, so there's the car. He wants to buy a Honda CRV EX or a Subaru Forester. And there's the price, $32,325 $325 is the price of the vehicle. So he's got them broken down here. Here's my option. Just go pay cash, $32,325. Be done with it. It's yours. You own it. Okay. The first option here is get a loan at 3.9% for 48 months. Now he broke down the payments here. He talks about the interest per year and the total interest for the loan. So... Here you have, at the end of that, he's paying about 1200 bucks a year in interest if he bought it for 48 months and with 3.9% interest. That means uh, $5,000 worth of interest. That vehicle would cost technically $37,365. If he did it at 4.9% for five years, well, you're paying a little bit more. You're paying about 15, almost 1600 bucks per year in interest. You're paying $8,000 total after the end of those five years. The vehicle is now about $40,000 is what it would cost. If you lease it for 36 months, here's the, I don't like leasing because they really stick you with the miles and any sort of damage. Mind you, this is your son's first vehicle. He's going to do little things that new drivers do, a little bump ding here and ding there. They're going to get you big time on the repair. So personally, I would say absolutely not. This would be my last choice would be leasing the vehicle. Um, and you have a whole bunch of different numbers there. That's great. So what, what makes this different, at least I like the approach, Peter, is when you look at this, he's saying... I could buy the car cash because I've got it. If I get the loan, which is 3.9%, which is pretty good, I could take that money and I could also buy T-bills and generate income from it. Aha, very interesting. So down at the bottom, what you have here, it says the T-bill income, right? Now, it depends on what duration, how long you're going to have these rates, but you see here it says 5.35%. So what he's saying is I could take that $32,000 worth of capital I could buy T-bills, which are going to generate me 5.35% interest. That's going to bring in roughly uh, $1,700 a year in interest. Okay. So far, so good. And you guys see what he's thinking here. It's, it's basically saying that if I get a loan for 3.9% for this vehicle for four years, and I'm earning 5.35%, I'm making net profit on that borrowed money of 1.4%, right? That, that's essentially what it's, what it's doing. And in essence, what you would be doing is lowering the cost of your vehicle. Now, here's the problem. You're using T-bills, whether you're using, you know, 
one month, three month, whatever, these rates are going to drop significantly in the next two years. Now, you're going to have this vehicle for four years um, and paying 3.9%. So let's go back to the Fed Funds futures here just to give you an idea. And this only goes out to just December of next year. So right away, if you're doing T-bills and the Fed Funds rate drops to uh, 3.75, which is the expectation, you're already going to be earning less than your, um, your loan rate. So if, and this is a big if, Peter, if you could lock this in uh, on those T-bills, let's say you could buy a five-year or four-year T-bill for your bond, they gave you 5.35% and the loan for the car was 3.9%, do it. Why not, right? You'd, you'd make yourself an ex, you'd basically drop the cost of that vehicle by about $1,800, almost $1,900. Um, exactly, Big Ev says, but that rate will not last for four or five years. Exactly. Now, let's be fair here. You know, you can go out here right now and you can go to Treasury Direct and I can tell you, here's the yield right now on the 10-year 10 year right now is 3.9%. So you could lock in for a decade 3.93%, which means you're only making 0.03% benefit from that long term loan. So, not to shoot holes in it, I love what you're thinking. It makes total sense. And I think it's, it's really smart because most people don't think like that. But if since you're talking T bills and those are going to change regularly, it's just the, the math isn't going to work. It, this rate is most likely, I would say there's a you know 90% chance that in the next year, that T-bill income, you're going to be fighting to get 3% or 4%. In another two years, it's going to be getting even worse than that and worse than that. So um, that's the, 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 the downside to this. So I'm curious to you guys, what would you do here? If you had your choice right now to buy your son a vehicle, you could get a loan for four years, get a loan for six years, which is going to be about 1% higher. You could lease it, pay cash. Um, what would you guys do? I think most of you would probably say the same thing. Uh, Lori says, with an electric vehicle, would you consider leasing it since they will continue to improve the quality over the next five to 10 years? We normally buy cars at Keith. Yes, uh, I don't have an electric vehicle, but if I were to get one, I would most likely lease it. I don't trust the technology yet. I just don't think it's, it's perfectly refined, so I would do the lease. Uh, but I certainly wouldn't get it for my, my son who's just turning. Sorry for your son, he's not gonna get a Tesla. <laughs> Uh, Oliver says straight cash and forget about it. Uh, Big S says cash and used. Uh, California says cash. Yeah. Um, if you, you know, it's tough because a lot of you may not have $32,000. And let, let's say that you only have $35,000 total in savings. I probably wouldn't do that. Um, I would probably put a bigger chunk of, on a down payment, but I would try to do as much as I could with cash. Now, I, again, I wouldn't buy um, a vehicle personally with a loan. It's just, it, I don't want to do it anymore. I don't want to deal with the lending. I don't want to go through the whole process of it. I don't need to ding my credit report, 3.9%. Uh, Look, I could keep some of the money and actually get a better rate of return, I think. Um, but yeah, I'd pay cash, be done with it. Be done with the car altogether. Most of you are saying, advise him on how to buy his own. Yeah, interesting. That'd be an interesting choice. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I wish my dad would have bought me a $32,000 car. That's pretty nice. Um, it Chris, <laughs> Chris, who runs a body shop, he says your kids will f up any car that you buy them. Yeah, well, I mean, I tried to be pretty respectful with mine, but yeah, I mean, you know, I definitely took mine off roading and had some fun with that thing and beat it up and beat it up and beat it up. But um, California and Peter, here's an interesting one. California says buy a cheaper car. I, I gotta agree with him. Um, you know, here's here's what I would do. I wouldn't, and this is maybe just parenting or my perspective and being frugal as I am, if I had a son or daughter that was going to get their first car, it would not be a new vehicle. Absolutely not. I would probably go buy a Honda Accord, Toyota Camry, something that's very reliable, a safe car that's probably not going to be doing 120, 130 miles an hour, not going to encourage them to go four-wheeling in this thing or anything. I would buy the, a used car. I would haggle and get a great price for it. Um, and I would probably try to work somewhere, some way where, you know, the kid could actually have a vested interest in that vehicle, meaning some of that money is going to be his, he, you know, he'll have to work to buy it to show him the importance of finance and all that stuff. So I would definitely buy a used vehicle, something that's, you know, a nice, reliable vehicle, but I wouldn't buy new for a, for, for a kid's first car. They're going to beat run it, man. Um, you know, when we were all kids once, all of us are kids once, and I'm pretty sure we all think, uh, exactly. Big F says, buy him a seven to 10 year old car. Totally agree. Totally agree. This is my two cents. Uh, for the first time car owner, get a secondhand car with cash. Chances of a newest driver having an accident are high. Yep. Yeah. So 
Um, Peter, I hope that your son isn't listening because he probably hates me right now and cursing at me because uh, you, we may convince you to not buy a new car. But, you know, down the road, you can. You can reward him with something later on. But you're right. Uh, new drivers historically have much higher accident rates. Why have an accident with a new car? Buy him a nice 1985 Volvo 240 SL, huh? Some giant tub of a vehicle that if they get hit, it's like, pfft, yeah, well. Although no, no uh, big uh, high-end safety features in those old Volvos like that. But anyway, Mike could just save me about 300. Wow. Wow. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. What kind of car are you buying your kid? John says my kid just saved me about three hundred thousand dollars last week. You buying your kid a Bugatti? What kind of car are you buying? Um, put the car in his name. Um, I can test teenagers getting accidents. You know, knock on wood, I haven't been in one, but uh, I definitely was rough on my vehicles. Tons of my parents pushed me to get a paper route at fourteen. I bought that six-year-old Mustang for cash at seventeen. Nice, good for you. It, we're we're in a different era, Tom. We're in a different era. And nowadays, parents are worried about their kids riding a bicycle around town, let alone having a paper route, you know? Oh, you get hit by a car, you get hurt, you get kidnapped. Uh, it's crazy, crazy. Anyway, uh, so there you go. Peter, um, oh, your kid got $300,000 in scholarships? <laughs> Holy cow. Bravo to you. That is absolutely amazing. Um, man, you got to feel proud on that one. <laughs> proud on that one. <laughs> like, I saved all this money for college, and now I don't need to spend it. That's great. First car was a Pinto. Wow, Big Eb. I'm, the, the story of Big Eb is filling in a little bit here. A Pinto. Mine was a Subaru uh, hatchback. Had a lot. 4x4. Four four. Love that thing. I went to the mountains all the time. But we all remember our first car, right? Well, yes. Um, Pepe had the Volvo 240, right? Good car. Good car. Okay, so that was it for questions. Peter, I, I think we've kind of solidified it. Pay cash for a used vehicle. Get something that's, you know, five years old. You, you can get some great prices now. Um, especially after the whole chip shortage thing, the car prices are starting to drop a lot. Um, you're seeing actually contraction in, if we look at the uh, CPI data, one of the biggest decliners outside of energy was transportation, particularly used cars. So the price of used cars are falling quickly. I would go buy a used car from somewhere. I wouldn't carry a loan. I'd pay cash, be done with it, and know that all the other money you have is yours to do what you want with, uh, and that car is taken care of. So that would be my two cents. That's what I would do. Got some good, we're, we're doing flashback lane over here. Ford Falcons. Good one. I, I like the old Ford Falcon. I, what was the other one? The Corvair that we went too fast. We actually kind of lift off the ground. They just designed it poorly. That was a cool one as well. All right, what time we got? All right, it's time for me to go. So let's go and look at your economic calendar for manana. Of course, it is Tuesday. I don't know why I kept thinking it's Thursday, but it's Tuesday. Here's your calendar for Wednesday. I'll talk a little bit about some of the economic data that came out today as well. Let's just go back to our data for today. Just because we had some TIC long-term purchases. I want to talk about this one for a second because it does mean a lot to us. TIC long-term purchases might be a new thing for many of you. It's a monthly report that's put out, but basically it tells you who's buying what. Are international people buying our bonds and, and stocks or are we buying more of theirs? So, what you see here on this chart, what you typically want to see is a higher number. That means that more foreigners are buying U.S. bonds and stocks. And we've seen a couple contractions here. Notice the past two months on this one have been um, pretty much at zero. What that means is they're about equal. And remember, our economy thrives with foreign investment. It does much better when we have foreign investment. And, and I don't know if this is a long-term thing, but it's two consecutive months where we've seen, last month, last time was negative uh, 1.7 billion, which means the US actually bought more of foreign bonds and stocks. This time it's a positive 3.3, which means they're buying more of ours. But it's pretty even. And normally because of the way our markets move, let's look historically, there's way more consumption from foreigners because we're the best market in the world. They should be buying our stuff. So keep your eye on this one. I, you know, I, it came out today. It's not like this is a piece that's going to cause the market to crash. But if we get a prolonged period, let's say four or five months, where this TIC long-term purchases stays at zero, the economy may suffer because that means that foreigners are not buying our stocks. They're not going to drive up prices. And of course, if you're long right now expecting this rally to continue, you need those prices to keep on moving up. So uh, keep your eye on that one. That uh, the piece came out today. They were expecting it to be a much higher number. They thought it'd be $37 billion difference, meaning... Foreigners bought $37 billion more than we bought. Instead, it's only 3.3. So while it is more, that number has shrunk significantly. And look how high some of these spikes were. 
You go back over into, um, let me get the uh, the month on this one. You go back to August of this year, it was $195 billion more that foreigners bought of U.S. stocks and bonds. Now it's almost unchanged. So that's that's a pretty striking change there, um, You know, going from such an aggressive purchase of U.S. stocks and bonds to zero. Now, granted, our markets are surging right now, so that's that's always a good sign, but just keep your eye on that one. I'll certainly bring it up to you over the coming months. Um, other than that, you had a bunch of FOMC members. You had some housing data today. Housing starts were better than expected, the tune of about 200,000 uh, housing starts above expectations, and you had a slight decline in building permits, but nothing noteworthy there. And let's look at Wednesday. Here's your numbers for Wednesday. We have more real estate data. Existing home sales will happen 30 minutes before the equity market. Oh, is that sorry, 30 minutes after the equity markets open. You also have crude oil inventories one hour after the market opens, and then more. Um, FOMC members will be speaking. You've got Goolsby speaking tomorrow as well. And on the earnings front, there's really nothing worth talking about on tomorrow's earnings. Now, as we get into these tail end uh, of the year sessions, there won't be really any decent earnings for this week or for next week. So uh, I'll just leave it at that. All right, let me run back through here. Um, we're, we got a lot of card talk. Wow, a Rambler? Love the Rambler. That, I think the, the old Falcon, I remember, it depends which year you had last, the dashboard was solid metal. So my buddy had one. It was solid metal. And, you know, in Northern California, we get some 100-degree days where I lived. And, poo, I'll tell you what, man, you don't, you, you, you don't forget when you accidentally put your hand on the dashboard. When you see that you feel, hear it sizzle, man. Uh, what else we got? A, 60, a 76 Corolla liftback. <laughs> the burnt interior is the first car. Very appropriate for you, Chris. You can have a lot of maintenance to do. Your parents were smart. Your parents were smart. Uh, if any TJ driver has a new car here, you'll have a bunch of new friends for all the wrong reasons, just saying, well, maybe that's a good thing, right? You have all these nice friends. Um, there. <laughs> oh, this is a fun conversation. I like the car thing. Maybe we should have a, do a show just talking about our, our cars. What we should do is do a Zoom meeting one day. I'll see if I can set up a Zoom room so we can all just kind of uh, do a show that way, like a romper room where all the different cameras on, but uh, that may be kind of fun to do one day. If you guys are interested, maybe we can do a, a Zoom show. Oh, Margaret, do you still have that one? An Oldsmobile Cutlass Supreme? Nice, classic car. Mm, 64 Rambler as well. Great car. Um, yeah, I wish I had a yeah, dream car. Let's, we'll do a show one day where we'll just talk about uh, dream cars. Yeah, I remember Kevin's car. I remember that thing. I think I might be the one that burnt your interior. <laughs> Don't blame me. It wasn't me. I didn't burn your interior. Oh, uh, all right, guys. Well, before we get the next ad structure, what's going to come in in a minute, I'm not going to torture you guys with that one. Uh, but let me know if you guys email me if you're interested uh, in doing a um, a Zoom. Maybe we can do like a holiday wrap up Zoom thing, which is fun because you can get microphones and do more chatting as long as you keep it orderly. But um, anything for a show topic. Again, I will not be. Um, I'm not doing a show Thursday or Friday this week or Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday of next week. Jerry Baldwin will be on next Thursday. And uh, tomorrow I have no guest. I'm going to see if I can coerce Larry Jacobson to coming on the show. It's my, my fingers crossed. I'll get him on before the end of the year so we can talk markets, election, all that good stuff. So, again, if you have comments, questions, feedback, tradermerone at gmail.com or put it down below any of the YouTube videos. I'm happy to check any answers there and, and give you a, a whole new show on whatever topic it is that you want. Ten seconds of your ad runs, everybody. That's it for me. Take care. I will see you all tomorrow.